It was important for Boeing and McDonnell Douglas to make their mark early in the 1970s, as a new competitor was snapping at their heels. The European Airbus project was a joint venture between companies in France, West Germany, Britain and the Netherlands. Their first design was the A300 Airbus, to be the world's first twin-engine wide-body aircraft. In December 1970, Henri Ziegler, president of France's Aerospatiale, and Franz Josef Strauss, president of German company Deutsche Airbus, formed a joint company, Airbus Industries, to build and market the airliner. The Dutch government and Britain's Hawker Siddeley Aviation were also associated with the company. Designed to carry between 260 and 300 passengers, the A300 was expected to cost $12 million US, about half as much as a jumbo jet. The alliance forged through the Airbus construction pioneered a new type of industrial collaboration in Europe. A central part of the fuselage was combined with a top half from Hamburg and made it to a lower half from Saint-Nazaire, with another component from Nantes. The wings were made at the British company Hawker Siddeley's Chester factory. Each piece of the jigsaw was then sent to Toulouse, where final assembly of the aircraft took place. Saint-Nazaire, on France's west coast, was a main U-boat base during the Second World War. Its new Battle of the Atlantic had the objective of beating the money-troubled US aircraft industry at its own game. But with so many nations contributing to design and construction, there was considerable worry that the project could become embroiled in politics. In 1968, the British government withdrew from the program after changes were made to the design, including the replacement of British Rolls-Royce RB207 engines with American General Electric CF650s. The government decision disappointed Hawker Siddeley, which was left, as one executive termed it, holding the baby. Prime Minister Harold Wilson was concerned that the A300 would go the way of the first Comet and the Concorde and become a drain on government coffers. He likened the international collaboration required by the project to a desert track littered with the whitening bones of abortive joint projects mostly undertaken at high cost. Another reason for the British government's rejection of Airbus was its commitment to supporting the national airliner project of the British Aircraft Corporation, the BAC 311. A similar design to the A300, the 311 was mired in controversy over its design and cost and whether the government should even be involved in the aerospace industry. The election of a conservative government in March 1970 sealed its fate and the following year, BAC abandoned development of the airliner. Despite the government's reservations, British company Hawker Siddeley believed the A300 would be profitable and continued to work on the wings, financing the development costs in-house. The result? A design marvel that was a key factor in the A300B's later success as both a domestic and a long-haul carrier. More than four million man-hours and 4,000 hours of wing tunnel testing was spent developing and testing the wings. The wing skin panels were 15 and a half meters long, milled in computer-guided machines and preformed in giant presses. As well as a change to the engine specifications, 1968 saw the size of the A300 scaled down. Sud Aviation Airbus Program Director Roger Bété secretly commissioned his engineers to develop plans for the A250, a 250-passenger aircraft 25 times lighter than the A300. When Bétaille revealed his idea, the project partners agreed that a smaller, more efficient airplane would do better in the marketplace, and the A250 was renamed the A300B and put into production. With a diameter of 5.64 meters, the fuselage was big enough to accommodate six across seating in first class, seven in business, and eight seats abreast in economy. Bete also raised the cabin floor slightly to accommodate two LD3 cargo containers side by side, an extremely clever innovation. In 